Welcome to the Change Log episode 0.4.0. I'm Adam Stakoviak. And I'm Wynn Netherland. This is the Change Log. We cover what's fresh and new in the world of open source. If you found us on iTunes, we're also on the web at thechangelog.com. We're also up on GitHub. Head to github.com slash explore. You'll find some trending repos, some feature repos from our blog, as well as the audio podcasts. If you're on Twitter, follow Change Log Show, as well as me. I'm Adam Stack. And I'm Penguin, P-E-N-G-W-Y-N-N. Fun episode this week. Talk to the guys at Reoc for the second time to see what's new with their NoSQL store. And probably more versed in this space after the NoSQL smackdown from South by Southwest last time, which uh, I, th- I think we chatted with them right before that, uh, that event back in March. Yeah, it was kind of an unexpected uh, surprise, really, to run into that NoSQL smackdown. And you got to participate, which was fun, but uh, excited to revisit that scenario, too. Yeah, we need to do that, especially now that the uh, the field has, um, I guess, expanded a bit. There's more players in the in the space and see how they, they stack up. You know, a couple of questions that I didn't ask the React guys that I wish I had of, you know, one of them is, are you web scale? Have you seen the uh, MongoDB cartoons that made the, the internets? I hadn't seen them yet, no. I'll put that in the show notes. That'd be awesome. It's the MySQL guy versus the Mongo guy. So I was curious of how... Um, you know, React stands up to the scaling issue, but uh, React is such a versatile player. It looks like it plays kind of at the low end against Mongo and definitely at the high end against Cassandra with some of its architecture. It's just uh, some amazing stuff. And they've got the new React search that's out. So uh, Mark and, and Andy give you the scoop on all things React. And uh, John Nunemaker joins us for this episode. So he's been playing with React, I know. So I pulled him in to ask some tough pointed questions. And plus he's... Uh... Big in the the Mongo space too, so he's kind of got a a side by side picture of what to expect and good question to ask when comparing. Exactly, you know, I'll be out in California, I guess, in a couple of weeks, and we're recording this the first or second week of uh, November. I forget what what day it is. I'll be out there uh, in the the fifteenth through the nineteenth. Hopefully, we can line up some some talks with some folks out in the Bay Area. That'd be exciting. If you've got somebody that you would like to see on the change log or here on the change log to talk about a project near and dear to your heart, send us an email at ping at the change log.com. We'll see if we can get them on the show. Absolutely. This is a good show. You want to get to it? Let's do it. We're joined today by Andy Gross and Mark Phillips from Basho, makers of the Reoc NoSQL database. Andy, why don't you start and introduce yourself for the folks that didn't catch the first episode. Hi, Wynn. Uh, I'm Andy Gross. I'm VP of Engineering here at Basho. Like you said, uh, we make the, the Reoc NoSQL database, uh, among other things. We've actually just released Reoc Search as well, and uh, it's great to be here. And Mark? Hey guys, uh, so this is Mark Phillips. I'm the community manager at uh, Basher Technologies. And uh, as Andy said, we have a, a whole slew of software that we're really excited about, React and, and React Search being the, the two primary. So uh, thrilled to be here as well. Thanks for having us. And Mark, if I slip up and call you Fark, it's because that's what your Twitter <laughs> handle is. You know what, Wynn? That is totally acceptable. <laughs> and I should mention we're joined today by John Nunemaker, who's, uh, I guess, of Mongo Mapper fame. John, why don't you say a quick hello Hello, everyone. And you can introduce yourself for the folks that don't know. <laughs> I'm John Nunemaker. I work at uh, Ordered List and do a lot with Mongo, React, and other various NoSQL databases. And occasionally, I'm forced to throw in MySQL in the loop. So I guess the last time we spoke uh, to you guys, it was back in February when um, we first um, discovered React. So tell us, I guess, what has changed in the, uh, in the React project since uh, February. Sure. Uh, we've had a lot of stuff change, actually. Um, we have uh, released a bunch of usability improvements. You can now download uh, React for, as a binary build uh, for various platforms, Debian, Ubuntu, uh, CentOS, OpenSolaris, Solaris, etc. Uh, we've replaced uh, some of the earlier storage backends with a brand new uh, high-performance storage backend called Bitcask. Um, and uh, we've also released React Search, which is a nice complement to the React key value store. Uh, the key value systems tend to have a somewhat limiting query model in that you can only look things up by keys. Um, with React Search, you can also search in a, in a full text fashion similar to, uh, to uh, Lucene or Solar. You can search by uh, the values of your objects as well. So it makes data a lot more discoverable uh, and gives you a much richer query interface. 
uh, a couple other things. We've, we've opened an office. The company's opened an office in San Francisco. Uh, we've switched from uh, Mercurial to, uh, to from Bitbucket to GitHub uh, and a whole bunch of other things that we'll probably get to later in the podcast. We'll, we'll dive down into the GitHub, uh, in the Git versus uh, Mercurial switch in just a moment. But uh, let's talk about GitHub, uh, React uh, Search, rather, for a moment. Uh, is it a standalone application or does this have to be used with uh, the key value store? It uh, it can be used in a number of different ways. Actually, you can use it. Uh, you can integrate it with the key value store um, uh, for React it stores data uh, in in uh, batches of keys and values called buckets, somewhat analogous to an RDBMS table. And with React Search, for individual buckets, you can mark them as searchable, uh, and just by side effect, everything that's put into that bucket uh, uh, has a full text search index. Uh, so you can use it in an integrated fashion with React Key Value. It also uh, exports a Solar uh, Apache Solar compatible API, uh, so you can use it as if it was an Apache Solar server. Uh, from you know, use existing Solar clients, use that same uh, RESTful API to uh, to treated it as if it were just uh, a more scalable uh, Apache Solar. What sort of languages are you seeing, um, I guess, buy into React as a, as a NoSQL solution on the key value store side? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, obviously we do really well with the Erlang community. Uh, that's where we started. And, you know, that was the first interface we really supported heavily. Uh, since then, um, you know, I think you guys had Sean back on in February, and he was writing the Ripple driver. Uh, and I'm sure, as, as John can tell you, um, that is a beautiful piece of code that is really taken with a lot of the Ruby community. So uh, we've seen a, a ton of adoption with Ruby and, and Ripple. Um, outside of that, uh, Java... Python, and uh, over the last two or three months, we've seen a, a ton of uptake uh, with, with Node.js, thanks to a nifty little uh, library written by somebody from the community called uh, React.js, actually, and his name is uh, Francisco Tricci, at Franco6 on Twitter. So uh, pretty good spread across the board, but uh, Ruby, Node.js, Java, and Python, I would say, are the top four. That may be the fastest, uh, other than the Node episode itself, that we've kept the Node.js streak alive here in the changelog. <laughs> So, John, you're a Mongo guy, writing Mongo Mapper. I was um, actually quite surprised to see you start to commit on some uh, React wrapper uh, commits on, on GitHub. So you played with React. Any questions for these guys as far as comparing and contrasting? Uh, yeah. So I guess why don't, why don't you guys talk a little bit, I guess, from your point of view of um, not necessarily we – can, we can talk about data modeling as well, but just from an administration Point of view, maybe what what are the benefits of using React? What kind of tools do you guys have that maybe other databases don't have, or where, where you do things a little bit differently? Sure. So our our one of our main focuses, a lot of uh, the people at Basho uh, came from Akamai Technologies, where we operated. You know, at the time, probably one of the larger distributed systems. Google came along and uh, and quickly eclipsed us. But one of the uh, one of the core uh, sort of design philosophies about React is uh, ease of operations. Uh, so it, we've spent a lot of time on making it. You know, easily elastic, so it scales both up and down. Uh, so you add a node; uh, it's a single command line to add a node. Uh, and when you add that node, you get a linear increase in in throughput and storage capacity. Um, and it also scales down. Uh, you can run many nodes on on your laptop. You know, I can run you know easily in the tens, you know, fifty React nodes on my on my MacBook here, uh, with no sort of loss of functionality. Uh, the other aspect to that is uh, it's a truly sort of decentralized system in that no node is special. There's not both not a single point of failure, but it also means that you don't have to pay, pay uh, special attention to a given node. Uh, they're all sort of fungible. They can come in and out of the network, and uh, that's tolerated really well. So that's one of the, the main focuses of React is, is that it should be easy to operate. You know, in the way that you describe React, it's a lot of the same language that the Cassandra folks use to describe that platform. What distinctions could you draw between the two? So, the, uh, yes, React and Cassandra are, are very similar. I'd say that uh, if you were to sort of segment the NoSQL space, you'd have uh, React, Cassandra, and Voldemort probably in the same group in, in their goals and that they're, they focus on, on scaling out. Um, React is a little... Cassandra has a slightly different data model, a slightly more complex data model, in that, uh, and that's from its sort of Google big table influence there. Um, so React is, is much more of a, a sort of just 
traditional key value store at, at heart. It doesn't have the sort of column family model that uh, that comes from Big Table. Uh, it also has a couple of interesting features that aren't found in Cassandra, like um, the the link relationships you can establish between objects uh, and built-in JavaScript MapReduce. Uh, and in the future, we'll probably be releasing some more queryability improvements uh, at the React Meetup the other night here in San Francisco. Um, we announced some some improvements to MapReduce uh, that allow you uh, to to sort of build some meaning into the values of your into into your keys, uh, and then perform you know regular expression matches of your keys uh, in a MapReduce job. Cassandra has MapReduce as well, but it's more of a traditional sort of Hadoop integration there. So you mentioned MapReduce and JavaScript. What sort of distinctions could you draw to Couch? So Couch is, uh, it's actually very similar to Couch, at least in the implementation. We both embed the SpiderMonkey JavaScript virtual machine. Uh, it's different from Couch in that Couch does sort of incremental MapReduce in that every time you write to the database, it maintains uh, an index for you. Uh, React's MapReduce is much more focused as a sort of ad hoc query mechanism uh, in that you don't, uh, React doesn't automatically run MapReduce when you when you write to the database. You you issue a MapReduce job as a query, you get the result back, and React doesn't save that for you. If you want to save that, it's um, you put it back into the database yourself. Uh, so ours is uh, uh, Couch's MapReduce is more of a sort of uh, internal query mechanism, where ours is uh, a, an external user facing means of querying the database. So you mentioned uh, links a little bit. Why don't you go into a little bit of the benefit of that? I, I see. When I look at it a little bit, um, you know, a little hint of the, you know, the graph side of the database world and stuff. Maybe where's some distinctions between there, or what what the benefits are, and. Sure. Um, so the links are basically a a tag you can put on an object. Any object can have a list of links to other um, to other objects, other keys and values in the React database. Uh, it's a three tuple uh, of bucket, key, and tag. So by uh, this allows you to have sort of ad hoc, flexible, lightweight relationships between objects. Uh, it's not quite a full-fledged graph database, nor is it meant to be, um, but you can model things like, you know, in a, a social networking example would be a user um, has uh, friends, and those friends have, uh, you know, wall posts, uh, you know, Facebook wall updates or whatever, and you can, uh, from, you know, the HTTP side of things, you can uh, craft together a, a, a URL uh, that just basically says, you know, slash users, slash win, slash friends, and then, you know, you can put a tag on those uh, friends in, you know, Texas. Um, so it's not, it doesn't have full sort of graph traversal features, but uh, it, it's a nice way, uh, and like I said before, you know, accessing stuff by keys and values can be, can be somewhat limiting. So we added the link feature to allow you to easily um, add a little more riches to your data and a little richer query interface by being able to just, uh, you know, dynamically establish these relationships between objects. Well, it seems like eventing is the new hotness in web application architecture. Node is built that way from the ground up. What about the other drivers for React? Which of these support that sort of asynchronous uh, architecture? Um, so all of the drivers are um, the, the the API uh, to React. We have two of them actually. I think the first time we talked, we only had had one. Uh, the, the, which was the HTTP interface. Uh, we find uh, that the HTTP interface uh, goes a long way uh, in that you know it's any language can talk HTTP. Um, but we we've recently added, or maybe not recently, but definitely since the last time we were on, a protocol buffers interface, which is a sort of binary. Um, um, a binary protocol that doesn't have some of the parsing overhead of HTTP. As far as I said, Node.js is probably the most sort of event callback-driven um, driver that we have. The other ones provide a, a relatively synchronous interface to React. So I, I, I don't think there's uh, maybe the Erlang one does as well. The Erlang one, Node and Erlang are kind of similar in their design. Um, Node is probably the most event-driven one. Uh, we also have a native JavaScript interface that's not integrated with Node. It's more of a sort of proof of concept that we. Um, that we provide, but um, all the other ones are, are a relatively synchronous interface. Talk to us about Bitcask. 
Bitcask. So Bitcask is really cool, uh, and that's another thing that's happened since the last time we were on. Uh, Eric Brewer, father of the Cap Theorem and arguably sort of grandfather of NoSQL, joined uh, Basho's board of directors uh, this past year. And uh, when we were talking about storage uh, backends, he came up with a, a really interesting idea um, in Bit- with Bitcask in that you can... If you if you have the capacity to keep all your keys in memory, which a lot of use cases you can you can do that, um, you can have a really simple, easy to design, easy to implement, rel- relatively easy to implement storage system um, that uses uh, basically the commit log as the database itself. Uh, so Bitcask is uh, an append only file format where. When you write a value to the database, uh, you write it to disk and then update a pointer in memory that's, that points to the file and uh, offset in the file on disk. Um, uh, and by keeping the keys in memory, you guarantee that for a read, you only have to do one file I.O. It's a very fast memory lookup in a hash table uh, that points at a file, and then you find that file and seek to a certain point to read the value. And for writes, it's a just simple append to a file. So um, Bitcask offers very, very predictable latency, um, uh, given that you can keep all, if you can keep all your keys in memory, we actually recommend that people use Bitcask uh, as opposed to our previous recommended storage backend, which was uh, embedded in ODB. Um, and uh, like I said, the latency is, is very, very predictable since you don't have to do a whole lot of random seeking around in a file to, to read a value. It's a guaranteed one disk I.O. for a read and a simple append for a write. And it allows us to also leverage the file, sh- file system cache in the kernel to, um, to, uh, to, to, to allow us not to have to provide any sort of complicated caching layer in, in React itself. So for, for a lot of use cases, or for at least the use cases that you can guarantee you can keep all your keys in memory, and this is just the keys, this isn't the whole, the whole value, uh, Bitcask is the recommended backend. And nowadays we really only recommend InnoStore for use cases where you, uh, you have so many keys that, um, that the, the memory requirement of Bitcask isn't going to work. Um, so we talked a little bit about administration and we've and uh, how you guys are real big on the uh, making that easy. Um, we've talked a little bit about data modeling, and I'd, I guess I'd be kind of curious about going into that a little bit more. So pretty much right now you have uh, key and value and then MapReduce for dynamic lookups. Um, maybe, maybe we could talk now a little bit about search and how that fits into the equation of, of getting at your data. Um. So, like I said, like we talked about before, yeah, there's key, key and value uh, access is, is sort of the React default. We then added MapReduce on to have a slightly more rich query model, uh, but it's still, there's some overhead in sort of walking through your entire bucket to, to find out about data. Um, interesting story about search. Search was really born out of one of our engineers, John mueller Lally's frustration with the limitation of the key value uh, model. If you guys have seen that NoSQL cartoon of the three guys in the office complaining about distributed MapReduce in Erlang, that was actually written by a, uh, a Basho guy. Um, and that was sort of the day that search was born out of uh, a, a desire to have a much more queryable interface to, to Reoc. So Search from the outside looks a lot like, um, well, Apache Solar in, in its API uh, and Apache Lucene uh, in, its, in its query syntax. So the, the Lucene sort of query syntax has become kind of a standard, um, a semi-standard in, in information retrieval. Uh, so in addition to the existing types of MapReduce jobs where you either pass in a list of buckets and keys or uh, pass in just a bucket and iterate through the whole thing, uh, with search, you can uh, you can insert a MapReduce job uh, that is formed as a Lucene style query. So you could say, you know, podcast and change log show, um, and get all the documents whose values matched that in some way, and then pass those documents on to a next phase of the MapReduce. So I think you'll probably see, uh, whereas before people would go through a lot of effort to sort of know the keys ahead of time or have to go through an entire bucket to find what they wanted. Now um, users can simply write in a uh, 
full text search query and start their MapReduce jobs off that way or, or insert that kind of uh, query to any point in the MapReduce job. So that's how you can access it from the key value store side uh, by just by adding another um, uh, MapReduce job type, uh, Lucene search. And it's not actually, sorry, it's not actually implemented in Lucene. It, it, it exposes the API, and we do have a little bit of Apache Solar code for text analysis, but on the back end, it's all written in Erlang in the same sort of style as, um, as the React Key Value Store. And so is that, is it content aware, or is it like, what does it kind of assume as a value? Like if you store JSON, can you index it in, you know, kind of search on an individual key in JSON, or do you need to have that actually as a separate React key or um, you can actually make schemas um, for your uh, for for individual buckets. Um, so uh, you can define different fields. Uh, it's it's I believe it's XML or JSON uh, from the Solar interface. Um, so you can say you know this field is a date, this field is a time, this field is a number, this field is a string, uh, and get the right sort of indexing semantics there. So it it it's not quite the Solar schema format. It's our own sort of format for the schema file, but. You can uh, you have a lot of flexibility in defining what fields are are what data type and which ones get indexed and which don't. So you guys mentioned earlier that you made the move from Bitbucket over to GitHub. So, Mark, I guess building a community around any project is is crucial. What went into the decision to go to GitHub? So um, the decision to to go to GitHub was not one that that we made easily uh, and hastily. Um, you know, we since. Before we open sourced React, it was developed uh, using Mercurial um, in house, and you know that was something that we were used to. And all our developers, though they were both versed in Git uh, and and, uh, and Mercurial, um, you know they stuck with Mercurial because that's that's what we knew, um, and and that's what we were accustomed to. So we open sourced back in August of last year, um, and didn't didn't think much of it. You know we uh, we were to be honest focused much more on on um, you know pushing out consistent releases that just made the code. Stronger, and uh, you know, we weren't really pushing for that that type of uh, community involvement. That that's uh, you know really advantageous to a large open scale, large open source project. Uh, so the move to GitHub was one driven not by uh, you know need for better version control technology. Um, Mercurial was a, a great system, and uh, you know all our all our guys, all our hackers liked it just fine. Uh, but you know the the way that GitHub has taken Git and put so much momentum behind it um, is is just something that you can't ignore. So, uh, you know, for me as a community manager and for you know the entire company looking for that deep level of community involvement, it was just something that was that was inevitable for us. Um, yeah, I mean, there's been a huge uptick in in pull requests um, since we moved to Git. Mark, I'd say maybe what was it, uh, four or five months back, we started mirroring onto GitHub, mm-hmm. and that was probably what did it for us. Once we once we did that, people expected to be able to submit pull requests and have them uh, integrated quickly and easily. Um, so it was really about the community and about desire for ease of external code contributions that made us made us move to GitHub. Yeah, and and uh, you know before when you asked about where we're seeing the most developer up developer uptake, uh, so Sean Cribbs' Ripple library and the React.js library that was contributed from the community are both hosted on GitHub and have always been there. Um, and you know, just judging by numbers of followers, granted that doesn't actually indicate code quality. Um, you know, those far surpa- surpass any driver uh, that we have. And actually, Sean's Sean's driver code surpasses that of, of the React repo itself. But I don't suspect it'll be like that much. Much longer now that we've we've switched. So uh, it, it was it was primarily for um, you know, community involvement and, and the exposure that that GitHub offers. So, so as users of both Git and Mercurial, what uh, contrast could you make between those two? Um, I, I think I mean they're really they they both provide the same r- real features. I, people uh, that have. People have compared the two and sort of done a side-by-side comparison. There's some things that are easier in one, some things that are easier in another. Um, so on, on the merits of technology, I'd say they're both about the same. I think we originally chose Mercurial because we're all sort of old uh, Python guys in, in previous lives. And um, the notion that we could write sort of ex- uh, commit hooks and stuff in, in, in Python was our, the initial sort of uh, – 
what is what made uh, Mercurial and therefore Bitbucket initially attractive. But we never actually ended up writing any. Uh, never ended up having to use that functionality. Um, and so, you know, I had a little bit of a learning curve getting used to Git, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really just a tool for us, and, uh, the, you know, the community was, uh, was, the big, was the big driver for that, for the switch. And so for you guys, uh, you talked about how you switched to GitHub and, and how you have contributions going up. Um, since, since Basho is kind of primarily the company behind React, what kind of percentage or feeling do you overall have of like who like contributing from outside of Basho and like contributing inside of Basho? So uh, we we have I think there's like a thanks file in the React source code and I, there's probably at least 30 people now outside of Basho who have contributed in some sort of meaningful way to the project. Um, being in Erlang and being sort of a database there is a somewhat high bar to really making meaningful contributions to the core, uh, but we're actually starting to see people do that now. Um, so most of the contributions are, you know, bug fixes, documentation improvements, uh, changes to the the client libraries, um, and we don't really have that many developers contributing to the core. But uh, we're seeing people starting to come up to speed enough with the with the sort of core. You know, distributed systems code and database, uh, you know, storage system code. Where I wouldn't be surprised in the future, in the in the near future, if we had uh, some external contributors actually making sort of large scale changes across the entire code base. But till, until now, it's been uh, mostly bug fixes and uh, contributions to the various client libraries. So back in March at South by Southwest, I had the privilege of participating in the NoSQL Smackdown at uh, South by. And uh, one of the exercises that we had to do was to kind of size up the competition, the other players in the space. And the only ones that were represented were Mongo, uh, Cassandra, uh, Couch, and um, I guess Amazon was was represented, even though it's not open source. Um, Their Dynamo database technology. If you guys had to prepare for such a hypothetical competition, what uh, distinctions would you draw between REOC and I guess the rest of the field? Where, Where does REOC shine? So it, it's really uh, around uh, both operational easy use and predictable latency is is one of the ones that since we released Bitcask we um, we're really sort of proud of the fact that um, you know there's not going to be wildly varying latency uh, in 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 your in your queries. Uh, so in these days where you know, we're really moving towards uh, sort of soft real-time systems where the correctness of a result uh, has a direct relation to how quickly you can get that data. Um, you, uh, latency is really important, um, and especially when these databases are, uh, you know, or users of React are uh, are building sort of uh, you know service-oriented. Um, you know, using React as a as a layer in another system, uh, so every sort of millisecond of latency uh, is you know comes out of some sort of bottom line SLA for the rest of the system. It's it's very important to be able to predict. You know, well, React will will always you know ninety nine point nine percent of the time uh, respond in this this amount of time. So the the sort of simplicity and elegance of the Bitcask data model. Um, and some of the soft real-time properties of, of Erlang make it very suitable for uh, latency-sensitive applications. And like I said before, the, you know, we're always focusing on, on operational ease of use. Uh, so if you want really predictable scaling without uh, headaches when you add and remove nodes, then I think that's really where React shines. So on the MongoDB side, uh, they tell you up front that if you need transactions, it's probably not your store of choice. What uh, caveats would you state with uh, React? Um, well, again, you know, I think for most of the NoSQL uh, projects, you know, transactions joins are just off the table to start with. Uh, with React, I'd add that you know it is a key value store at heart. Uh, so trying to bolt on uh, more complex. Data models um, is is you know just be aware of what the what the strengths of the system are. Uh, that being said, you know with with things like search that 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 sort of caveat is becoming more and more blurred, and we do plan to release other database products that uh, um, that have richer query models. Um, but I would say you know just know that it's a key value store. 
uh, and, and design your app accordingly. So uh, I guess my next question would be maybe for Mark Moore. Um, you know, obviously the developers that are listening to this are open source developers. They're people who, you know, they end up with their own little kind of communities around um, projects and stuff. And I was just wondering if, you know, Basho and React, and now this is starting to get to be pretty well known and stuff, if you had any tips for someone who's managing their own project, like how to get the word out or how to manage, you know, community contributions and awareness and things like that. Maybe if you had any tips for the people that are listening. Certainly. Um, thanks. Thanks for asking that. And quite frankly, I'm, a, I'm I'm quite flattered you would do so. Uh, you know, we, we've come a long way since we first open sourced, and I think I took this position uh, back in, um, maybe it was, it was May or so, maybe April or May. Uh, and what I found to be the most effective, and, and we were lucky because we had a clean slate, uh, but what I found to be most effective was just get the basics down. So I think when we were on the show last, or when Andy and Sean were on the show last in February, we didn't even have a wiki. You know, make sure you have a, a wiki up there. Um, something that I've, I've done that I've that for some reason has been remarkably successful is I write something called the React Recap uh, three days a week, so usually Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And uh, that is just a plain text email with anywhere from three to, to ten bullet points um, with what's been happening in the community over, over the last uh, two days or three days. And um, it, it goes through anything from blog posts written by people using React to um, new libraries that have appeared to bug fixes that have gone in uh, to new wiki pages to uh, events happening in any corner of the globe uh, to I even go into um, our, we log our IRC channel um, and I go and kind of curate conversations that may not appear in the wiki and I kind of dig through there for tidbits that people might want and also for uh, things that help us update the wiki. Um, other than that, you know, just I, I send a lot of uh, emails to you know to people who have expressed interest here and and who have a question that didn't get a follow up maybe uh, a few days ago. Um, so it's a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one stuff that that isn't really happening in the public forum, which kind of generates a uh, bigger buzz maybe a week or a month down the line. Um, and uh, other than that, stay up stay up to date on the space. Uh, you know, so I'm. I spend a lot of time reading blogs uh, about Mongo and Cassandra and, and the other players in the space and MySQL and Postgres and all those guys. So uh, I guess, I guess that's, that would be some advice to offer. So it's not just about uh, grabbing developer mind share. You also need some, some wins and, um, I guess, demonstrating adoption of the platform. You know, John's living proof with, with um, Mongo that they're using it over with Harmony, their CMS application. What big wins do you have with, with Basho? So um, open source, uh, I would say the, the one we're most proud of these days is, is probably the Mozilla use case. Um, and maybe Andy can speak more to the specific uh, stuff they're doing with querying and whatnot. But they're running uh, several React clusters, one of which is to, uh, to kind of log data given through their, um, their test pilot project. Uh, so we've worked those guys pretty extensively. There's some, some great um, blog posts by them both both on just using React and, and kind of benchmarking and performance, stuff like that. Um, there's another nifty little startup out of uh, Amsterdam we're pretty excited about called WideScript. And uh, Frank uh, Francisco Trici, who wrote the React.js library, is kind of the lead dev on that project. And uh, I, those guys are not out of beta yet, but uh, I'm really excited to see what they do with that. Um, so Mozilla, WideScript. Uh, there's actually a page on our wiki called Who is Using React. So if you go to wiki.basher.com and on the, on the left column there, you'll see who is using React. Uh, there's about 15 companies that we know of open source. Uh, there's another great um, company called Inagist, which is uh, using actually React and React Search right now. We just found out a few days ago. Um, and uh, oddly enough, I'm getting a lot of emails out of the blue that just say, oh, by the way, we have React in production, uh, which is you know, really nice because you know that the database is rock solid. And these are people we've never heard from on the mailing list or never seen an IRC or never tweeted about using React. And uh, it, I think it kind of speaks to the, the, the simplicity of getting a three or five node cluster running and just starting to pump data into it and serve requests you know, out of it. So uh, that's that. Well, this is the part of the show where we turn it upside down and, and ask what's on your developer radar. It seems like through the magic of Skype, we may have lost Andy. We'll see if we can get him back. But if not, Mark, why don't you go ahead and answer the question. What out there in the world of open source has got you excited that you just can't wait to play with? Oh, geez. Um, so a yeah, bit of a tough question for me because I'm focused more, oh, more on the, uh, you know, the, the promoting and the, and, the, and the code development rather than actually the usage. Um, so I'm sure everybody has answered Node. 
Uh, we're, we're pretty excited about Node as a technology. Um, we partnered with Joint to use, uh, to, to kind of build uh, cookie cutter and really powerful um, React machines on their platform. And through that, we've been talking to a few of the guys over there, uh, Ryan Dahl, and I believe Isaac is his name, who did NPM. Uh, about you know better ways to integrate React with Node, so a lot of our developers have been checking out Node and seeing where we can kind of contribute to that. Um, other than that, uh, I uh, am actually just pretty thrilled about the other NoSQL databases. Um, you know, a lot of people see us as in competition, but uh, you know we're we're good friends with a lot of those guys, and they write really good software as a rule. And a lot of the people that we see using React are actually using React alongside of you know, uh, a MongoDB or alongside of a Redis. Your Redis seems to pop up in every single application. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, just seeing the other players in the space do really well is something that is good for the space, but also something that we're all interested in. So, you know, if we come off as cutthroat, it's, it's, it's not the way it is. We're excited about Redis, too. We're trying to get anti-res on the, uh, the show. Yeah, he's a... Uh, if, if the amount of code that he writes is any indication, I don't think you'll be seeing him for any time. <laughs> One second, let me drag Andy back in. All right. So, Andy, we, uh, we're just at the radar question, so I'll, uh, I'll pose it to you as well. So, Andy, about you, what's got you excited in the world of open source to play with? Oh, God. Um, lots of stuff that I don't have time to play with. Uh, I think some of the new JVM languages, well, I guess they're not so new anymore, but things like uh, Scala and Clojure are very interesting to me. Um, and uh, you know they're they're on sort of the top of my queue of things to uh, to investigate and learn. Uh, other than that, uh, I'm really excited about Node.js. I, I've gotten a, a, a little time to play with it since the React.js library was released, but doing more things with that. Um, but mostly, uh, you know, this may sound unoriginal and kind of lame, but but React. Uh, you know, of all the things that I do and all the open source projects I've been involved with, uh, I really look forward to some of the stuff we have in the pipe um, for React and uh, exciting new stuff as well. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us.